My earliest memories are of being told about Afghanistan. I didn't know really where it was, but I knew everything about it. Because from the earliest time in my life, my earliest childhood, my father told my sisters and I about it. He would go on and on and on about the stories and the folklore, about the size of the melons in Kabul, about the chapel sandals from the south. He would tell us how the pine nuts tasted and how the kebabs made your mouth water like nothing else. It was an obsession for him, the kind of obsession that only someone who cannot live in their homeland can have. And with the Soviet invasion in 79, he became very infuriated. He thought the West had turned its back on Afghanistan. So he wrote a novel which he called Karakush, and it was subtitled An Epic, An Epic of Guerrilla Warfare and Gold and Treasure. Decades passed, and the situation changed. Afghanistan was freed from the Russians, but the Taliban took over, and then 9-11 happened. And after all of that, I found myself pining for a homeland that I had only inherited, really, through my father's stories. And I wanted to go there, too. And I wanted to see if it was all just like we had been told it was. In a way, my father had given us a crash course in Afghanistan, an A to Z crash course. There was every, I knew about everything, you know. But at the same time, I hardly knew the place at all. He used to bring us to Morocco, as I've often said, because for him it was the easiest place or the safest place that was similar to Afghanistan. But the time came when I really wanted to go to Afghanistan myself. I remembered the story of Karakush, the legend of Ahmed Shah Durrani, who stole somehow, supposedly, stole the lost treasure of, of Nadir Shah, which happened to be of Mughal India, and got his hands on it inside Afghanistan and hid it. Because the story goes, he didn't trust anyone, not only his, his son, Timur Shah. So the story goes that Ahmed Shah Durrani, in the 1700s, hid this colossal treasure, valued possibly today at about $500 billion or even more, and that he hid it in an ancient Buddhist cave complex. The only people crazy enough to make a film in Afghanistan, I thought, were my great filmmaker friends, David and Leon Flamhock. We had made a film in the Peruvian jungle, and Leon, the father out of the two, father and son, had spent a lot of time in Afghanistan in the 80s under fire. So we planned this wild madcap idea to go to search for the lost treasure of Ahmed Shah Durrani worth billions of dollars. And the reason for that was to make a film that looked at the culture of Afghanistan rather than the politics or the current situation. I wanted to make a film that other people hadn't made or were not going to make by looking at the cultural bedrock of the country, a country that I have been taught about in a very back-to-front, inside-out way, as I've described. Quite famously now, uh, while doing pre-production in Pakistan, David, Leon, and I were thrown in a torture prison, a very nasty torture prison, in Pakistan, in the northwest frontier. And we languished in, in cells and solitary confinement there for 16 days and 16 very horrible nights. When we got out, my wife hoped that I had closed the book, buried the idea of going to Afghanistan. But one of the first things I said to her in a quiet moment afterwards, in a whisper, I said, we're going there, you know. We haven't dropped Afghan gold. And so we went four or five times I flying from here, Da Khalifa in Casablanca, and landing at the shocking airport in Kabul. And we had all kinds of adventures. 
we met tribal leaders, rode horseback in the valley of Bamiyan. We met dignitaries, and much more importantly to me, we met ordinary Afghans, all kinds of ordinary Afghans. And we learned from them how their lives were. But best of all, we saw glimpses of medieval Afghanistan and heard a lot of stories about the treasure. As for the treasure, you'll have to watch the film, which is on YouTube. But it became increasingly dangerous. Every time we went to Afghanistan, I could see a very, very small window of opportunity was closing shut. And it really got worse and worse until one day the car took incoming 9mm fire and David, the director cameraman, was shot in the thigh. And I could see that the last grains were really falling through the hourglass and we would have to leave very soon. As for finding the treasure, well, watch the film, as I say, because we found bones, human skeletons and horse skeletons, in a cave complex above Bamiyan. But best of all, it was a time for me to remember the stories that I had heard as a child and reconcile those with a reality which in so many ways is more powerful than anything else.